All right. We're going to begin the meeting. What time is it? 5.33. I've already gone the call to order uh, and I've done the roll call. So now I have to make the statement. This meeting is being recorded by the Charter Review Committee. Any other person uh, present are doing the same. You must notify the chairperson at this time. Anybody else recording the meeting? David, I don't think you're actually recording the meeting because when I signed in, I didn't get a notification that you were. Okay, let me find out. Uh, we can start again. Otis. Can't hear you. I, I have an icon in the top left that says it's recording. Little round. Oh, that red. red that yep. red circle? Yep, if you hover your mouse over it, it says recording. Okay, okay, thanks. No problem. I just see meeting information. Is that all the way up in the upper left? Yeah, my neck right, It's a, mine says meeting details and right next to it, there's a small red bullseye that says recording. All right, well, I don't see that on mine. Otis. What about now, can you hear me now? We yes. Can hear Okay. Yeah, um, the meeting should be recorded. I had to move to a different computer, but it should be uh, recording still. Um, should I start again? I only got to the roll call. I might as well start again. Yeah, because I'm taking the minutes, so if you would, that would be great. Okay. I'll call to order the statement. This meeting, is, this meeting is beginning it now officially at 535. Uh, this meeting is being recorded by the Charter Review Committee. If any other person, if any other persons present are doing the same, you must notify the chairperson at this time. Anyone else recording? If you are, let me know. You're not saying anything means you're not. Okay, roll call. Chris Forgey. Alan Wood. Here. Sheila Gilmore. Here. Don Lund. Here. Don? I'm here. DJS here. Otis? Here. Aaron. All right, the first order of business is to accept the minutes of the January 23rd, 2020 meeting. Have you all received a uh, copy of the minutes? May I hear a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Thank you, a second? Second, Wheeler. Okay, any discussion about the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor of accepting the minutes say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? I abstain. I wasn't there. Okay. So it passes with all agree except John, who wasn't there. Okay. Um, so, to the end of the, of the um, charter stuff, so we can be really prepared well for the uh, for the fall. Um, I spoke with the mayor, and I want to set a deadline for people that she's reached out to to re to respond to us by the end of August. And I'd like to see us meet again the second week of September, so that and and between now and then, I'd like people to start thinking and maybe sending out to everybody what what provisions of the charter they think might need some amending. And for the next meeting, I can comp I could prepare a pretty good agenda to start going over those sections, uh, you know, just to make sure that we're all on the same page about what sections we all think are important, add in some of the sections that the town thinks is important. And we could either, and then we should, I think we should then uh, call for a public hearing or maybe have one more work section, but I'd like to have a public hearing by October with us putting out, you know, some of the things that we're thinking, having the people come for the um, the voting and anything else. I know there's rewriting the petition provisions, which we'll go over tonight. And, uh, and then by November and December, we can write our recommendations. I'm not trying to rush anybody because I think we can have some really good conversations between now and then, but um, I think tonight will be a good opportunity to just focus on the parts of the charter that are the last remaining sections. Um, okay, so I'm so and the mayor's not going to be on this call, and neither is uh, 
uh, Councillor Forgey, who was a mayor, obviously, before. Um, so let's start with Article 5. Everybody on to that? Mm -hmm. So just so that, I mean, for, two, for several reasons. One is because it's important to have a process that works for financial stuff, for, for dealing with the budget and the fiscal issues. And also so that uh, none of the members of either of the bodies can make, or especially the mayor's office, can make this political by by shoving a budget down the throat of the council uh, five days before it's due, or before the, or, or put us into crisis. We have a charter that um, that lays out what the uh, what the timeline is for each of the budgets. The, the two main budgets, the two main budget drivers. One is the general city budget. And the other is the school committee budget. Well, the first thing it talks about is just how the school committee works. If you're on the council, you know this, uh, or at least you've gone through it once this year. If you're not on the council, you might be aware of it when you read the paper that you know sometime in the beginning of the of the of the uh, calendar year, the school committee, having already probably gone through a lot of discussion in the fall, finally presents its budget. And then it goes over it itself, and then it presents it to the mayor, and then the mayor, um, you know, has to incorporate that budget into her budget. All right? Any questions on that? And then um, the mayor also has to submit to the city council uh, his or her budget. I guess produce some sort of a budget message. And then it goes into the council, and the council has to act on this budget within 60 days. As Otis knows, uh, you then have to go to through the whole. You have to go through the Ways and Means, all the departments, um, have hearings, and ultimately within the 60 days, sometime at the end of May, beginning of June, the, the city votes on the budget. Um, any questions about about that? I don't see this section as needing any change. It did go through a change in 2010, and I think it was a good change. It was a mechanical, some, some mechanical changes, and it, they seem to have worked. So unless somebody's a budget wonk and really thinks these are important. Um, and then there's supplementary budgets and there's other appropriations. So this, this also helps to, so you can appreciate how you pass the budget and you're allowed Mayor's allowed to come back, and you can amend the budget or make other appropriations to help fill in gaps, move stuff around. Um, an important section is 5-9, which shows that um, anybody over for that overspending. So it gives the mayor and the city councilors great pause, and the school committee and the superintendent. Great pause about what they're doing because any BS. And a couple of years ago, when everything hit the fan, technically some people could have been responsible for some of the problems that occurred personally. But since we're such a nice city, nobody went after anybody. But that could have been a real. That could have been the first time that I would have seen anybody go after somebody for. Might have been hard to figure out who was responsible. But, so there's a lot of responsibility on the public officials to come in within budget. Same, we have a capital improvement program, and um, the same thing. Uh, um, Otis, if you want to, if there's anything you want to add to that, but basically, that the, the city is also planning ahead uh, for its capital expenditures, which is pretty much based on borrowing money. So all of that is, you know, it's really important, but it's really dry. So again, unless any of the counselors, especially, have anything about this that seems to be not working. Any questions like Aaron or anybody, Alan, from your reading of it? Does it sound? Um, so the administrative organization. So the charter went through the trouble of naming certain organizations in town uh, that are important and continuous, what they're supposed to do. Of course, the mayor, uh, I believe, and I, I mean, I. I can't say without looking at these one at a time again. I believe the mayor has the right to appoint all these committee, all these uh, committees or boards. And if you go back to what we did last time, it's subject to the review of the um, of the city council. The city council can nix an appointment, 
by uh, nine thirteenths vote. But otherwise, uh, they're approved. Um, some of these positions, I believe, are actually hired. Like, I think that the Department of Missile Finance is a hiring. The Department of Planning and Develop is a hiring. Human Resources is a hiring. License commissioners are appointed. Recreation Commission, Public Safety Commission, they're appointed. Um, now, just I'm sorry, are, we, are we looking at Article 6 now? Yes. Okay, sorry. I, I, no, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I blinked. You don't know we're on six. That's my fault. Um, so I went to six. All right. You caught up with me, Sheila? Yes. I'm just scrolling through it. Um, so, I, know that this bit, I know that. Go ahead, John. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, just when you think it's appropriate, I just had a question about six nine, the Board of License Commissioners. Sure. Um, well, it's a bit of a comment. If you look at the actual 6-9-A that says what they're responsible for, and if you look also at the established ordinances of the town, there's a pretty big disconnect with what the charter and the ordinances say the Board of License Commissioners have within their purview and what they actually have within their purview in practice and in historical practice. And it was just something that I was looking through this sort of, if you go through the rec commission and the municipal finance, it all tracks pretty well. But if anyone else has been to a board of licensed commissioners meeting, there's a lot more that they do. And I'm wondering if anybody else is, it isn't my intention to, to try to limit what they do, but it just doesn't seem like neither the charter nor the ordinance reflect the actual function of the Board of Licensed Commissioners. And I wondered if people thought that was a discussion that was worth having, or if people were just comfortable with that kind of disconnect of practice. No, of I agree. I think if, however we're doing it, we as a city get to decide that, but we need to put it on paper. We need to make it clear. Otherwise, residents will look at this and say, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing. So we need to at least be transparent about it. And I think that it, that's probably the importance of updating this every 10 years, right? So yeah, exactly. what you're saying, and Sheila, what you're concurring is that you think that 6-9-A doesn't expressly grant to the licensing commission, the powers that they otherwise uh, play. Well, it really only references MGL 138, which is about alcoholic beverages and licensing of victuallers. But they end up weighing in on street signs, on what public land can be used for. They weigh in on everything from that to block parties, to all sorts of stuff, to allowing Actually, festivals first, first. in the town. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I mean, I think over the years, it's just sort of organically grown into being a group that actually a lot of different people have to go to, to get their permission to, and it may be that just the preponderance of practice has made it sort of, I, I just don't see that if you look at what it says under license commissioners, and if you do go to the ordinances, the ordinances are tremendously sparse there that says, this is what the power of the license commissioners board is. It doesn't line up at all with how they're actually utilized in town and what the history of their uh, purview has been. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying the two things don't jive up at all. All right, I can I can help you, but I I think it's a good it's a here's an exercise that we would of, of what we should do. So when we were a town form of government, the licensing commission was the board of selectmen. Okay. Okay. So we did not have a separate licensing commission. But because the mayor has a full-time job, um, if you read past, if you read in the beginning in the middle of the third line, it says, and be the licensing authority, it says, and, be the licensing authority for the purposes of chapter 138 and chapter 140, 
which I have all the other powers with respect to licenses okay. prior to the adoption of this charter were exercised by the Board of Selectmen. So what I would suggest is, and I think it's a really good point that you brought up, what I would suggest is that we look up Chapter 140 and see what that says. Uh, if somebody wants to do it while we're doing this, I don't, I, I'll do I, only, it. Have two, I only have two screens. But um, I think that's what it means. So that's where it's, it's interesting that you should say that because in my experience with the town and being an attorney going before the board for liquor licenses, it used to be that you went before the board of selectmen. But remember, they were the executive branch, so you were talking to the executive branch. So it was a, you were talking right to the executive branch. You weren't talking to a committee. Now you talk to a committee that's made up of people that are your, just like other boards, you know, just like the Conservation Commission, the Planning Board. Same thing. It's a group of people. But their powers, um, I believe, are, are because of that sweeping language and the statute. But if if I we could find that they're not complete, we could absolutely, let's put, you can make, you should make a note for yourself, the two of you especially, that when we come back uh, in the beginning of September and you have a list of things you want to look at, let's look at it. I'm going to look at it too, but I think that does solve some of your problem. Could I jump in when you're finished? Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, my experience as a precinct counselor in dealing with this is that you're both correct. The um, powers of them are are broad as delineated by that um, third and fourth line, uh, uh, David. But John, I think you're also correct in that the uh, their purview, and Sheila agreed with this, is is very broad. And I have brought up really significant issues, disputes between a condo association and a, a, a business with, you know, worth millions of dollars. And at that point, the licensing commission has not really felt um, that it was something they wanted to mediate. And, um, and so at that point, it kind of goes up the ladder because um, technically, the mayor's chief of staff as director of general administration um, oversees uh, Lori, the, the clerk to the licensing commission. But I've spoken with um, Danny Letourneau that this is an, is an issue where there are, there are really um, complicated, important decisions that sometimes fall to the licensing commission. And sometimes when that happens, everyone agrees that it's not, it shouldn't be in the purview of a volunteer board. Um, but so far I haven't heard or thought of good solutions to that. Um, yeah. You mean, a, you mean a, a, is it because they're a volunteer board and they're not trained? Or, I mean, we have planning boards and zoning boards, they're volunteer boards. Sure, yeah, yeah. The, the, the planning board, you know, a zoning board that goes through a lot more training um, than, than licensing. Okay. Well, and they have more dedicated support too. I mean, they have the director of planning and development that is well versed in the particulars and even a cursory look at chapter 140 and all the sections in here, Lori Krikorian would have to be a renaissance person to be able to cover all the issues that that she would have to be able to advise them on and she's not even a full-time employee so right. she is think that is capable but it's yeah, she's helps. very capable she's i don't mean that in her. any way to, i don't mean that in any way to denigrate lori i i'm more pointing out that oh, the, the idea that she has anywhere near the resources available to her all right so to let's, be able let's, to advise let's, board on such right. is, it's, that's just right. True. This is a good one. This is a good one to work on. In fact, should we? I mean, who should we go to to get some um, help? Should we go to the chair of the licensing commission? Should we go to Lori? Uh, should we I just do it ourselves? To, I would talk to Danny Letourneau. Talk to Danny. Yeah. Jason. So maybe those other two people in addition. That way, we're getting kind of like a full view of. Different perspectives. They were right now. Huh? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead, please. That's okay. Um, I think one of the issues you talk about with a volunteer board, you know, even with a lot of training, um, in some cases, you know, the volunteers who are on our boards are, you know, retired, but in other cases, you know, they might have full time jobs and maybe they just, you know, 
don't have the capacity to kind of deal with some of these bigger issues sometimes. So we need to make sure that they have a reasonable workload for what we're, you know, the amount of time that we're asking them to commit and make sure that they're able to actually right. fulfill these duties. Is yeah. it, is it that, um, so, so let's say that there are these issues that we've noticed that the licensing board is kind of gets stuck deciding. So if we were to limit the licensing board in an appropriate way, where would those issues go in the future? Where would those, who would hear those issues? Good question. I think there's such a breadth to the potential areas that are within the purview of the licensing board. I think it has to be a little more defined because people may have sort of by common acclamation said, well, this isn't something the licensing board can handle. But that means nothing in the face of somebody challenging it on the basis of mass general law. It, you could go and say they can't decide any of this or they can decide all of this. It just needs to be a little more spelled out. If they, it covers a tremendously broad area. I would imagine a lot of them are appropriate for the licensing board. It may be that people in town feel that some things aren't and i don't believe it's been the practice for them to actually have the full breadth of authority that is stated in that line the in the lines that you read to us so sort of making sure that everybody has a common understanding of where their authority lies i think would be helpful to everyone including i would imagine the licensing board too yeah, and maybe some people from the business community also, because I've heard some things about people who are starting new businesses about, you know, having to, you know, submit some sort of document, but they only meet once a month. So they didn't get to open as soon as they thought they would want to open. And we want to see lots of businesses opening, and especially, you know, in the face of this pandemic, when it looks like we might be losing some, it might be good to reach out to like the Progressive Partnership and the GBA and some, some folks like that to hear their perspective also. Okay. Is this is this a case where um, I mean we either need to uh, specify what powers or issues are done or are are uh, available to the license commissioners or say everything except and then uh, limit some other ones and. Figure, figure out who, who decides those. You could do that. Um, I, I, I don't know, how, given the fact that it's a very, such a broad area, that that's one way that, you know, constitutions or whatever uh, do uh, divide up powers by making it specific to this, 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 and making it uh, nothing related to this, this, and this. Okay. Oh. That, it sounds to me like this is one that's going to need our attention. Um, so. so, again, we're a recommending body, so we can give some, we could give recommendations. We don't have to just say this is how it should be. Maybe that's a good way, but we could have a couple of recommendations for how to do this. But again, I think that, I think that the intention, just so you understand the intention was we had a board of selectmen, now we had a board of licensing commissioners. They're going to do the same thing that the selectmen did when there were licensing issues. It was as simple as that. Just transferred all that power over to this body. So, you know, whatever those complaints, you you've always, you must have heard selectmen complain about all the dog cases they hear and all the, you know, I mean, that's, that's their lives to hear a lot of the smaller, more common disputes. So I'm going to say for you to think about this in a couple of ways. One is the idea that that's what happens, so that's why they hear everything, okay? And the other is what Sheila was getting to was, uh, or both of you were, was the idea that, um, you know, what does it mean for this commission to have this much power to make these decisions? What do they need? Is this the, you know, if you're hearing from people about getting certain licenses, now the liquor license is the most obvious. Actually, does the liquor license and then they have the power, they're the ones you go to if you want to have a protest on a place where you need permission ahead of time. So those are two important things I can think of. So that's a good one, and thank you for bringing that up. All right, do you mind if we move on just because? Okay, Not at all. That's a, that's a good one. Actually, could we, could we go back a little? 
Um, so section 6.6 .6 deals with central yeah. maintenance and they just got absorbed by DPW. So I wonder if we want to move this around to reflect that new change. Oh, that's too bad. Oh, maybe it's not too bad. Okay. I think the mayor did. The, I think we, let's see. So again, this is, this is history. That's why we're doing the beginning part. I don't, so before the charter, there was a um, there was a committee that was set up to explore central maintenance as a way to take from the school committee their maintenance budget and centralize it with the city budget. Because when the when the um, when the schools get chapter is it chapter nine? No, what what's the schools? Chapter ninety, chapter seventy. When when they get seventy. When they get their money included our maintenance issues, what happens to that money is the school department says, we don't have enough money to pay teachers and teach our kids. So we're, pay we're gonna take the maintenance money and we're gonna pay salaries with it. So, some, so we are, the maintenance of our, of our infrastructure, of our, especially our schools and our town was deteriorating badly. So we did a study and we determined that the central maintenance should be set up. And since we didn't have time to finish it in the ordinance, I mean, in the, in the charter, you can see it's a very, um, it just says by ordinance. So um, we, is there an, I guess my question is, is there an ordinance that says that the central maintenance is part of the DPW? <laughs> I don't think it's an ordinance. Um, I don't know. We saw. Um, because it's never been written you know, specifically uh, in the charter. No, we saw we saw that there was a new org chart, and it might not be completely finalized yet. I don't know. Otis, if, do you have a yeah. better recollection? It was finalized, um, and it certainly it, it has already been been implemented. Um, you know, George George Vandalin is no longer director of central maintenance, um, his, his authority has, has generally been um, ceded to uh, Marla Warner. Um, I don't have the rec recollection of whether we changed the code. Um, and I'll try to check my, my records here, but, but it is spelled out in the code. So I would think we would have done it. So Sheila, maybe what we could do if, if you remember, there's the charter that's really hard to change, and then there's ordinances which you all get to change without having to deal with the mayor. So maybe instead of consistent with recommendations, we could just say as provided by ordinance. Because if you if you give the central maintenance to DPW by charter, and then you find out that you want the central maintenance to be independent of the DPW, you have to amend the charter. But if you keep the if you if you just make an ordinance that says we have a central maintenance and it's part of the DPW, then it'll remain that way until you change it as so. So right, I think that might I, be a good idea, but I don't want the charter to look different than what we have on the ground. You know, we don't need residents coming and complaining that we're not following our own rules. People are doing that over this. No, oh. no, I just, oh, I just, so I don't know. Point. I was in the military, okay? Like if it's on paper, this is how you do it. Period. Mm. <laughs> well, okay. So, well, that's that's good. That's a yeah. But also, the language should be something that works. May I ask a question? Is there, in fact, a central maintenance committee? There was. This committee was formed, two thousand and one, to review the the issue of of convincing the schools. The schools had to vote to release their central maintenance money to the town. So they had to go through a whole committee. We met for a year. We made recommendations, and as a result, the recommendations kind of uh, were the, the recommendations had been made by the time the charter was made, but they hadn't been implemented. So Mayor Martin was the first person. No, it is. Not, it's would not. I would not have it remain no, the same. No. I would say, my suggestion is. There will be a Department of Central Maintenance that shall, uh, who's, you know, that's defined that's and described provided. by city ordinance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I but agree. That's why, you. that's why that happened, and it was Mayor Martin who it was Mayor Forge who did not do anything about it, and Mayor Martin 
Mar Mayor Martin seeing the benefit of taking that money from the school budget and making sure it was spent on the on property. So, okay, good point. Anyone, anything else before this, Sheila? Anybody? Aaron? Anyone? Alan? Okay. Planning and construction of municipal buildings and other facilities. So believe it or not, there's an appointed committee that, you know, right now we're, we got the library and the fire station and we would build a new town hall. So there is a committee that's out there made up of people who have construction background that kind of advise and get ahead of these projects. So believe it or not that, and they're working right now, I believe with the library people. The Department of Human Resources, that's a, I believe that's a job that's a hire by the mayor. Uh, oh, am I going backwards? I'm sorry. Um, now, the Public Safety Commission, I wanted to talk, I was going to jump to. Okay. There has been some suggestions that I've heard in the paper about, um, you know, having a board that oversees the fire and especially the police. This is that department. So if you if there are if there's a need to amend this or focus on it on that this is the section. I think that one's going to take a lot more discussion and I think a lot of these discussions are already happening in the community. Um, off the bat though like I kind of don't like that we say he and his in all of these references to chiefs. I know that both of our chiefs are, are men right now but if we could kind of Go back to the, you know, to they and there for this. I would appreciate that. In case All we right. ever have a woman fire chief or police chief. Sure. Can you can you make a note to yourself, Sheila, to put that yep. as a yeah, okay. good point? I may miss that, so I want to make sure somebody. Uh... All right. Uh, library trustees. Interesting. So. Who would have even thought about it before the library became in such prominent view? But the mayor picks a group of people who run the library and they have certain powers, but they also answer back to the mayor and that's part of how the librarian is hired and everything else. So that's, it reads pretty straightforward, but again, if anybody, I mean, oh, we got two suggestions from the library people on changes, so we can, we can, Uh, zoning Board of Appeals, Board of Assessors, City Constables, Board of Health, Registers of Voters, Council on Aging, City Attorney, Planning Board, Conservation Commission, and there's some minor boards that were listed. I don't know if that list is accurate still, 6-22. Uh, Oh, I was going to say if anybody wants to talk about that after 6-23, the Cable Advisory Board is not really a board that exists all the time. It's mostly organized around the negotiations that happen with the licensing of cable in the town that just wrapped up last year in their 10-year contract. So oh, it, it can exist, but there's not really anything for it to do. So if it says consisting of three regular members serving staggered three-year term, there's literally like three terms where somebody would be elected. In. So. So you're saying there's no work for that board to do? Their, their only job is to serve as an advisory board to the mayor. I mean, they could be kept alive just to provide perspective if the mayor wished for it, but the only true job of the cable advisory board is to do the negotiating. In this case, it's with Comcast. There are, every town has one to negotiate the licensing um, for um, PEG public education, uh, for PEG access for community TV. And those are 10 year contracts. I, I was actually on the last one that we made our recommendations to Mayor Martin I guess it was two years ago now. Um, and in between, sort of traditionally, there's not really anything for that board to do. So you can appoint people to it. It just is a board that doesn't meet unless there's a contract for it to assess. 
Okay, that's a point. Put that in your own notes for recommendations. The other thing is this um, for GSET, was there something created that needs to go into the charter? Well, because I think an ordinance created something, right? A, a certain uh, group. It's, that... a, it's a, a, an order from the governor that essentially transfers all the powers of the mayor to the board of commissioners for GSET. But is that something that should be in the charter? I don't know, is my answer. It's, uh, there's, it has the same relationship. It, it runs as an enterprise fund. Uh, so it's governed by both chapter 164, but then also a little bit by chapter 44 because of the enterprise fund. Um, Honestly, I think my best is I can talk to the GSET lawyer and let you know, because I don't know right off the bat if that's something. Well, that should when, be. This, when this board was appointed, did it go through the city council? The, yeah. the mayor, yes, the first one did, that's right. That's right. The mayor appointed the first one and, and because of the changes, it was reviewed by the council. Yeah, and another one that we're missing is the Human Rights Commission. There's no mention of them in the charter. Are you sure? I'm, I'm not seeing it here. So unless it's somewhere else in the charter. I thought I saw the Human Rights Commission when I read through this, but you could be right. There certainly should be one. But maybe it'd be a good idea to go through the town's website and see what commissions are listed and make sure that all of them have some sort of reference in the charter. Sure. Mm -hmm. No, the Human Rights Commission should be in here. Absolutely. Hmm. Thought I saw it. It's okay. Not. It's not. No. Okay. Good call there. All right. So I'm circling things, you know. G said should it be in the charter, human rights, add to charter. I think we want to do that. If you all on the council, I mean, if you have access to the ordinances, I, I would bet that the Human Rights Commission is at least empowered by ordinance. And yes, it'd be nice it, is. To, it is. All right. So it'd be nice to move it up to uh, the charter level. Good call there. I swear I saw it. I'm saying that it is there because that's what you say. And then the uh, Mayor's Task Force Against Domestic Violence actually was put in in 2010 as a add-in. So we can add in. Any other questions? Aaron and Alan, I know that you know, you guys aren't involved in the town as much as we are. Is there any questions about this this section? It just codifies things, you know, to make sure we have these agencies available. But I do like the fact that I cannot believe the Human Rights Commission's not in there. That'd be a good thing for us to recommend, and for you all, if you're gonna if you're gonna this could have a good thing about how they inter interrelate. Um, okay, so let's go to Article 7, the most talked about section in uh, Greenfield. <laughs> it's really a piece of garbage, the way it's written. <laughs> go ahead, Aaron. I can't hear you, though. It's frozen. Did she freeze or is it me? No, I, she froze. No, she froze. Well, I have a question about the. Now you froze again, Aaron. I promise when you come back in, we'll talk about it. What should she do? Should she, anybody know what she should do? Right. Sometimes if you turn off your video, it helps. Okay. okay. Aaron. All right. Election-related matters. Um, 
So the first thing is this idea of a preliminary election. Sheila, you're familiar with that, right? Yep. Not and, that it mattered, uh, but okay. Uh, what's that? Not what's that, that it mattered. That's the point. <laughs> um, I think this is where they want the, what's it called? The, uh, what's it called? The graded ballot or the, what's it, help me. Uh, Terry Plotkin wants to put in where you, uh, you put in grade eight, you, you put in choices of who you want. Oh, ranked. Yeah. Right. Yes, ranked choice voting. I believe that's on the state ballot this year, is it not? It is. So once that's enacted, I think in our, then we, we have less power because we have to follow their rules to a certain, you know, we can't go below a certain standard. So. That would make it more complicated for us to do it, although we could we could change it around the state law. But the fact that there's no state law, I don't know if we could do that. Okay, so there's a series of questions. One is, can we do it for a, for a national election or a state election? It's one thing to do it for a local election. We can't, right? No, no, only local. No. Only local. So you'll have this local, uh, you know, this local election process. Yeah, so I, I believe this is on the state ballot, and I haven't looked at a sample ballot yet, so I, I haven't been able to verify it. Um, but East Hampton put this into practice recently. So we could check in with folks in East Hampton and see how it's working for them. I've actually looked at it, but yes, yeah, you're right. That, that'll be good. I would want to talk with Kathy also. Yeah. I know it would it makes it makes election day a little harder, but nobody nobody really fell in love with doing these preliminary elections. Okay, so that's gonna be a that's gonna be a conversation and I think that um, that's uh, Terry Plotkin and his group are gonna come and speak at the public hearing. So I think we wanna hear from them as well, uh, and just see what, you know, again that would be uh, oh I think this has to go to the voters because it's a change of st of how we elect people. I don't think the council can do this. But just know that, you know, again, when we organize our recommendations, we should make a list of things that the council can do subject to a petition, obviously, ironically. And then mm -hmm. uh, the things that the council probably can't do or has to they can initiate themselves or the citizens can initiate, but it can't, you cannot vote it in. So that, that'll that be something that we, we we're going to have to help out the council with, I think. Um, yeah, and if I may, um, there was another issue that we've talked about on the city council recently that came up um, regarding the precincts. There was a suggestion um, of having everybody run at large and have fewer precincts, or maybe you know the precincts would not matter at all. And it's, I mean, I don't even really have an opinion on this yet. It's something that we talked about, and I can't, I can't remember the context that we brought this up in. Um, but that's worth discussing just because it came up in the last year. Sure. Again, though. Again, though, any recommendation that the council ends up making would have to go to the, this, that's another voter uh, suggestion. Yes. That would be an interesting discussion. We all get locked into what we're doing and it seems so good and then you make a suggestion, it's like, oh my God, what do we do with that? What happened, is Aaron back yet? Okay, seven six uh, petition to school committee, which is this, you know. So we're going to have to review. Aaron, you want to set are you in? I'm here. Sorry. Do you want us to ask a question? Oh, I I thought I put it in the chat. It was just about the recreation director that many other directors seem to be listed in the charter, but that one is not. Okay. Again, make a note of that for yourself. And when it comes to um, suggestions to make for the charter, put that in, please. Yep. Um, again, it's, 
these referendum procedures have to take on several layers of discussion. One is they have to be written in plain English. At fourth, first and foremost, they have to be written in plain English. Secondly, there are parameters. The, the, the process itself is somewhat tedious. Do we want to streamline it? Do we? So, you know, do you have to go to the city lawyer first and all these other things, which I have to tell you, this is boilerplate, pretty much boilerplate language. And then the next, the, the most critical part is how many, what percentage of people, how many people will it take to make the petition uh, valid? So should it be, what percentage of the voters should it be that get this petition moving forward? And there's, should it be a smaller group so that uh, citizen, so that the citizens still have a stake in most things that go on in town government, city government? Or should it be a higher threshold so that it should be more or less a firm issue where people get involved, but let the, the let the councilors and the mayor do their job, and if you don't like what's going on every two years, throw the bums out. So I think that's really the, and again, I think the committee, be an interesting discussion, but the committee can make recommendations along those lines, and then the council will have to decide. Um, Again, I'm not sure if that one requires the the voters, but ironically, if you if you piss more than 400 people off, they'll just file a petition to make you make it go to the ballot anyway. So, <laughs> that one might not be the easiest thing because now, with everybody so well aware of this these provisions, there'll be a lot of um, it'll it'll probably have to go to the voters, is my guess. Even if you guys, if if you all decide on it. Uh, so, yeah, my, I think I thought, um, this is Alan. My, yeah. my thought is in, in some way or another that this uh, provision, both for the uh, initiatives and referendum, I mean, I would like to make it be a hard process, but not too hard. So, you know, somewhere, somewhere in there uh, where uh, if if the people of Greenfield are really uh, disgusted with action by, by the uh, council and the mayor, then they should have recourse. And yet, it should not be uh, able to be used for anything frivolous or you know something just off the cuff. Um, you know the idea that it um, it you know needs. Um, a certain amount of people is, um, you know, to, to me, that's an important part. And it, and it does mean essentially that, um, you know, the elected form of government is not, um, not representing the people very well. I, you know, if you put a very low threshold on it, you're saying, well, you know the the people who are elected aren't aren't representing us, and so we should be able to take action and uh, you know easily. Um, uh, so anyway, that's that's just the preliminary uh, my preliminary thought. And when I looked at the other um, uh, the other charters that relate to it, they're kind of all over the map, all the way from. Uh, I don't know. I think a total, you know, one specifies 250 voters. Another one says something as much as 15% to even, you know, 15% uh, of registered voters to put it on the ba on the ballot. So, right. um, so well, I thought. If, are you finished, Alan? Yeah. I don't need to cut you off. I no, just. Uh, I thought that. Thanks. I thought that Christian's uh, research was really useful. And what jumped out at me was that there was consensus from those five cities around the referendum uh, petition thresholds. They all were within 12 to 15% of total voters. And we are at, two, uh, is it two and a half percent? Two and a half, yeah. Versus the 10% of the previous uh, you know, voters at the election. So I think in, unless, there's a very good reason why Greenfield should be completely different from all of the surrounding communities. I think that, you know, there's a pretty good argument that that should be brought back in line with something um, more along the lines of what our neighbors are doing. Yep. And that's going to be a hard, you know, you, you have your hand, you know, you, 
once this gets to the council, you have a lot of work to do. Uh, it's easy for us as a committee to blah, 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 make recommendations, but you know, you all are going to have to have discussions and then public hearings, and you're going to probably meet some resistance, and you're going to have to see, you know, how to navigate it for some of these issues. But these issues, I believe, from my own heart, need to be discussed, and they need to be changed based on those discussions. They cannot, we cannot hold off on this, this section any longer, in my opinion. It, it's not, it, it has to be clear so that the clerk, if you want to help the clerk's office, this has to be really, really clear. Um, well, did, David, I have a concern because there's one part, and this tripped me up when I was, when we were first hearing, hearing about this, there was one petition that came to us that had 10 signatures, and then there was another petition that came to us that had the two and a half percent of the voters. And I know now that it's the difference between the referendum petition and the, the initiative. I think clarifying the difference between those two, because they do feel very similar, I think is another important thing we should tackle. And I don't know if other towns differentiate between the two, or if they're kind of part of the same section. But since you were part of the initial uh, charter, I thought maybe you would have some background on that. Can I interrupt just for a second for a housekeeping thing? I don't, I'm sorry, but someone has something very close to the microphone that is causing a lot of like shuffling of paper or scratching sound. And I'm actually really having a hard time hearing what people are saying. Sheila, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I, I literally barely heard what you said because there's a sort of a <laughs> scratching that's very loud. I won't Actually, stop. Was, yeah, that was distracting me too. I'm happy to repeat myself if people didn't hear me, but what I was saying was with the citizen referendum petition, we have two and a half percent of the voters. And then with the citizens, uh, let me go back and see what it's called again. Um initiative it's 10 voters and that was something that was very confusing for me the first time that i heard about this and i think that it's probably still very confusing for a lot of people who weren't following this play-by-play -play the way you know the city council was and our most engaged members of the community so i don't understand why these are two separate measures that are that are um in different paragraphs so i was asking david for some clarification since i, I don't know if other towns do it this way or um, maybe if we could be a little more clear about what these, you know, the difference between these two processes are. Sure. Although I don't think any, I don't think we've seen, but somebody please correct me if I'm wrong. We have not seen an initiative, but we've seen the okay. referendum. We've seen an initiative too. Which one? Um, not to name names, but um, there was one that came to the oh, council. you saw one on time. the council? You yeah. You saw one on the council. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. And how, how far did it go? Not very far. Okay. So I think, I think one of, two and a half percent was amended. So we had 10%, I believe. We had a higher number. It was amended down based on the idea that people have a right to protest. But I, 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 I'll, I could, I could, I can tell you how that you know the other side is equally compelling. So if the if the city council or the school committee does something that you don't like, you have to gather more more signatures to be to, to begin a referendum against that movement, and then uh, and then submit it with the percentage of voters. So to get started, you need more people. To get it on to get it on the ballot, you need more members. I think the 10 was just because it doesn't take very many people just to come before the city council and try to initiate something. That's all I could say. I, I don't remember as a counselor myself ever having anybody bring an initiative except zoning initiatives, which you have to just put in the hopper even if they're not, even if they're not going to go anywhere. So again, these are things to think about, like why, but the initiative would be some, would be a group of people asking the council to do something that they haven't been thinking about. The other is to say the council's now voting on something important and we don't like how they're voting, or the school committee for that matter. So one is to say, we don't like how you're voting and we're gonna put it on the referendum even though you, you, don't, you, you wouldn't do that if we didn't pull it out of your control. And the other is, how does a citizen ever get the council to talk about something that they think is important? 
Okay, so maybe some clarifying language would be helpful because yeah. what you're describing is not what I, that's not the situation that I felt like we had with this. Um, Initiative? Yeah, I, I think it was something a little different than that, but I'd, I'd be happy to take a look at this and try to clarify it. So like, let's say the, the, uh, the bags issue, right? Let's say the council never wanted to take up the bags issue. It just didn't. They never put it on the agenda, never came up. Well, you can't, you can't do a referendum petition because you haven't voted on it. So it's not even anything I can, I can't do anything until you act. With an initiative petition, I can come to you and say, by petition, I want you to take, I want you to start thinking about this. We, you have to take this up. At least you have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. So it's a citizen's way of making you as a legislative body discuss something that they want. But I have never participated in it in any detail. So I can't tell you the thing I don't want to say right now, but we probably will have to talk about with the right answer is if the council talks about it and decides to do nothing, then what? Then I think an initiative petition has to take on a greater momentum. Then you have to have more people involved because then you're really usurping the council. Then it's like, why vote for a council if if, if we're going to pass ordinances by by petition? So that's how I generally that's how I generally looked at it. But I could be wrong, and I'm that's a good point, and we should come back to that. This section is going to take up a lot of our focus. And again, I think it'd be if, if we would do a good job for all of the counselors if we were to answer these good questions and bring to the council an understanding of what this means in plain English. Another part of it, by the way, and I don't know if you can legislate it out, are the items that are called um, ineligible. Mm -hmm. You know, by stat, there is a statute. If if we don't if we're silent on these initiatives, there is a state law that allows for this to happen. So we can only make them, we can make them um, better. We can, we can change them in one direction, but if you, if we're silent, if we, if we cross out section seven, there are state law would, then we'd follow state law, which is 12% uh, of registered voters. And then there's another provision about initiating citizens petitions. So this is supposed. So if we read the law and we read this, we could see that why why this might you know might you like you might like to amend this to make it better, easier, harder, whatever those things are that, but but the state law already allows for it. So all we're doing is modifying it, like we would a board of health regulation or something like that. But the ineligible members, on, based on statute, is a smaller list than this. So I don't know. I need a legal opinion whether we can block citizens' initiatives from funding of projects, for example. You know, like if you want, so the lot, so you know, if the fire station comes up again or the library came up, if these things are voted on by the council, can we say that there it's an eligible citizens can uh, um, can do can can protest? So you're probably going to punt on all this as a council because it's going to get complicated. But those are the kinds of things to think about. I don't mean punt completely, but you know, if you add fun, if you add funding, do you want you know you're going to add something else, something else, something else? You know, where do you draw the line? So um, it's going to be, I think, it'll be difficult. Uh, and the city council, it looks like, can um, submit to the voters, um, which I think you know. Isaac Moss liked to do that a lot. You know, he'd get stuck on a, he'd feel like he was hearing from a lot of constituents that uh, that it measures to go one way, but the council wanted to go another way. He would always say, well, why don't we just take it to the voters? And you can. So you can punt if you want by right. And this gives you the right to do it. Now, recall elections. Any questions on any of this stuff? I mean, we're going to talk about it again. And we should all do our homework too when we get to these points because it's one thing to talk about, it's another thing to be right on about it. These recall petitions, um, the only thing that I know absolutely needs to be changed is by copying another community. They didn't have the same precinct setups as we did. Um, they didn't have an at-large and a precinct. So uh, when, um, 
who was the counselor that the uh, recall uh, recently? Um, Burns on. Yeah. So the way it's written here, if you're a precinct counselor, you need to get the votes of the entire community, and that's not how it should be. It should be the members of the voters of your precinct. So for better or for worse, so if Ferns, if Ferns Precinct loved them, but the rest of the town didn't, they weren't the ones that had the right to kick them out. It's your own count. You, you, you are you, the voters of your councilor, should have the have the right to kick them out. So, did, well, that, that's what I think. I mean, I'm I'm forming an opinion, but I think that was an oversight on our part. That was just like not because it doesn't make any sense. But again, maybe it makes sense to you guys. I, well, I, I believe it says within 712B that it is 100 voters uh, for a precinct rather than 500 for an at-large. Um, no, but there's 500 more voters. Uh, you know, I, I question where these numbers came from because to run at large or to run for mayor, you only need 100 signatures to get on the ballot. So why would you need 500 signatures to get kicked out? That's fine. That's fine. And that's, that's I think fine. 25 for a precinct counselor. Now we've got 100. So I, I think it would. I think the numbers should match better. Well, remember, uh, you know, recall, a recall. You don't. I mean, again, as a, as a, as the, as the. Uh, Person who's creating the rules of the game. Do you want only a hundred people every time they're mad at somebody to call for a recall? You want a lot of people to be able to run for office, but do you want people to be recalled so easily? That that's why the 500 voters is uh, is the. I don't know. I like the idea of have that you know like the the break in case of emergency glass. I think is a really important thing that we you know that we need to maintain. Okay. Again, um, right? if we're not gonna if we're not gonna say that these numbers need to match the exactly what the numbers are for getting on the ballot, they should at least be the same ratio so that removing a precinct counselor versus an at-large counselor is not a different ratio of voters. Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, I did look at some of the other charters, and unfortunately, there isn't a truly really clear benchmark. There, there is the general sense that I think you're right, Sheila. There, there is a general sense that there isn't a, a connection between how many people you need and how they're dispersed throughout the community, whether it's from one district or a certain percentage from each district. I, I did not see in looking at the other charters any real correlation between the two. It might take a hundred to get on the ballot, but if you go to East Hampton then it's 400 and 60 of them have to be from mm -hmm. each one. It's just different. 400 people in East Hampton to get on the ballot? Oh, no, 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 for a recall election. Just well, saying, totally I don't, different. unfortunately, I don't think there's, right, they're not common metrics that we can look at and go, oh, well, right. clearly. Right. This is right. what you want people, people to be, you want people to feel like they want to run for office, but you don't want people to feel like they can kick, they get kicked out for the first vote that they make that 100 people don't like. But Alan, let me, again, that's my opinion. But Alan, in the sentence that you're talking about, what's missing is 100 or more voters of the precinct in which the counselor, uh, you know, it doesn't say of the precinct. So it makes you believe that you go back out into the community and you only get 100 voters for a precinct, but you need 500 voters for an at-large, which is true, but... It's, you don't know where you're getting the voters from. It doesn't describe whether it's the precinct or it's from the community. So that's the sentence. That's the magic sentence that I think needs to say from the precinct. Mm -hmm. Correct. And then the number is again, you know, all of you guys in your notes, if it's important, let's bring it to the council's attention. It's fine. Yeah, I just don't want the telling you the reason arbitrary. why those numbers are not the same. You do not. A recall should be something that, again, has ex gets really everybody's attention. Not right, just but I'm saying if, if we have to double the number to get on the ballot, it should double in both places, not double in one place, but be five times as much in a different place. I just okay. don't want it to be arbitrary. Yeah, it, but I, again, it's it's not it's not an arbitrary number because it's supposed to be a high number. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. You know, 500 is arbitrary to the extent it's 500, but the reason it's not 100 is so that it's harder. Because I don't think you need 100 signatures to get on a precinct ballot, do you? I think you might need 50. Yeah, 50, 50. 50 or 25. You know, so it's pretty easy. So just anyway, just something to think about of, of how how these things are written for civic, you know, for civics reasons, not, I mean, but again, it's. Uh, yeah, I think you have to be careful in a direct ratio. You want to make it easier for people to try to participate in local government and participate in democracy. The The idea that you want to remove someone is by its nature a little more open to being used as a flail where one right. thing you're trying to make it a low bar so you'll get more people to try but i've served on boards and run for stuff and and you know no one can serve without getting people upset with them i think it should be harder to remove someone than for someone to say hey i'd like to participate in this in the first place so i'm not against the idea of a ratio but i do think it should reflect that and reflect the fact that whether we like it or not, yeah. some of these some of these ordinances and laws and charter propositions are now used to kind of gun for people rather than being used as part of particip participatory, excuse me, democracy. Yeah, and another thing to kind of like shoot hold my own argument. Uh, so I ran for and then you know for mayor is kind of like a law that my leaders in just stand out anywhere and get anyone to sign but in the precinct it's difficult because you have to knock on doors so maybe we should look at that because when you're selecting a certain precinct versus the entire population there's like this shotgun method that you can do when you're running at large or if you're collecting signatures at large that is different for a precinct counselor so but i mean we can move on i'm just kind of I'm, I'm thinking through my thoughts so let's try this another way. As a precinct counselor, I got 275 votes and I was a precinct counselor. The at large person had to run and, you know, fight for more, a lot more votes, right? And I had the same vote on the council as that person did. Right. That's I had a true. one thirteenth vote. And yep. I was eligible for to be president. And I was eligible for everything else that that person who had to run. And the reason we did the at-large, maybe that's something to think about. The reason we did the at-large was to create a uh, minor league system for mayoral candidates so that if you ran at-large and you got a lot of votes, then you were becoming a powerful political figure so that when, you know, so that you could, you knew that you were starting to grow and, and have some power. So when the mayor came to you trying to, you know, say, hey, I got elected by... Like if there were only precinct counselors, the mayor could say, well, I got elected by 3,000 people. You got elected by 300 people. You know, I speak for the people. 3,500 votes for my position. And so, you know, that's how I, that's, I have a lot more strength in my position as a, you know, as a person who's got the full support of the community. So that was the reason for the at-large. Uh, we can, with that, if, if, and that's something else to consider, but that's why we did it. It was a feeding yeah. ground for uh, for the mayor's office. To well, and on a more practical level, I know I get emails from people who are outside of my precinct. Um, sometimes they're saying, oh, my city councilor won't respond to me. Is there something you can do? And I don't say, oh, you don't live in precinct six. I'm not going to help you. I mean, you know. Right. So I think all of, and I think that most of my colleagues do you respond? I, the person I'm thinking of is no longer on the council anymore, but um, I think we all kind of operate as at-large counselors anyways, so I don't know. But we can we can move on. It's, it's But it also gives it also gives a precinct person access to four at-large counselors. So I have you, Sheila, you're my counselor, but I got four other counselors that I can really stare them in the face and say, you represent me too. You know, I'm from Precinct 5, and I know you don't like my politics, but guess what? You represent me, too. So it also creates, just to add to what you're saying, that's a that's an argument for at-large counselors, because then the issue, the, those four counselors are kind of there in a broader sense of uh, yeah. of what's going on, and you could more 
Anyway, just a, that's just how we did it. Oh. That's just the back and forth. Yes, the John. last quick thing I would say is, to me, this is all an argument for any recommendation that comes from us to the council to, to sort of align themselves around basic principles. The basic yeah. principle that an at-large counselor was created for a reason. The basic concept that it should be easier for someone to participate in democracy, local democracy, than to be removed from it. The idea that there needs to be some split between the rights of people in a particular precinct versus the community at whole, and the rights that all of these rules, ordinances, charter propositions have to be balanced enough that they can be used properly for people to have a say in local government, but make it harder for it to be used, unfortunately, the way things are in a more polarized world where you know, where things like this are often used to just try to gum up the works or to try to go after somebody. And that kind of balance, I think, based on a couple of real simple principles, that's just my, that's just what I think about it, ought to be what direct us. Let's make it easy for people to become part of the, the process. Let's not make it too easy for people to indulge in ax grinding and grudges against people who are already there. And let's make sure we have a balance between the whole community and what the particular interests of people in a precinct are. And and that's a good point because you you get when you talk about this stuff, you get you want to dive into the deep, you want to dive into your emotional piece, right. you want to dive into right. the unfairness that you see in a particular provision, which is appropriate. But if you if you're, and this is the reason I went over this with you for two sessions, is to, if you understand the charter as a whole thing and what you're trying to accomplish policy-wise, then you won't get sucked into some of the things that will pull you in a direction where you'll find out the hard way that you've kind of, you've created an imbalance in the pro, in the in the policy. Right. That's all. It's right. not like any of these things are wrong, but. If, if if you see it as a policy issue and there's many and there's a balancing of policy issues, that's that's where you end up, I think, if you're writing a charter. There might be an ordinance right. that might have a different quality to it, but clearly the charter should be a balanced exactly balanced place that's a good starting point for how we run our government and not have the government be either taken advantage of or on the opposite side, especially with the city government where people were afraid. We don't want the city government to be outside of the ability of the citizens to say, we're throwing you out or we're changing right. what you did because right. you haven't, we voted you in, but you didn't listen to one word we said. And right. so you're not really representing us anymore, so we have to kick you out. And so those principles, we all agree on. The question is, where's that point in the on the continuum where you put the marker and what happens is, is like what I've seen in the last 18 years, you see by experience. So you see doing whatever it was doing. And at the last minute, 394 people were able to push it to a vote, which meant it was delayed. And then the, the ultimate vote was like 70% to 30% to do the library, which was, you know what I mean? So. When you think about things like that, you think, okay, so is that okay? Maybe the system worked. That's just the way it goes. Or was that really an issue where if it was 70, 30, but 494 people got to petition it, shouldn't it have been a more burning issue so that a thousand people were pissed? I mean, would they have gotten a thousand signatures? You know what I mean? In this uh, circumstance? So it's just an example. And I use it as an example of how to, like, where do you find the number? And who the hell knows? So. Anyway, if there are no other questions at seven o'clock, I don't know, four <laughs> seven, um, I'd be happy to move on to the next meeting, which now we're gonna start, now it's gonna start getting, we're, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to have meetings where the, we have to finish the meetings by accomplishing things or at least directing things off to, com, little, to people to come back. I know you're gonna hate this. I think we should take off August. Come back the second week of September. If need be, have meetings more than once a month. Um, or just kick ass at meetings and take it through. But I'd like to hear from all of you. Um, and I'll put it out in an email uh, 
in, in a couple, in, you know, by the next couple of weeks. As we've discussed all this, what are your pressing? What are the provisions in the charter that are pressing for you? What are suggestions that you've made? Like, like even as important as Sheila's, you know, his or her to they or them, you know, I don't even think I could write it properly. And let's um, and let's and, and let's send that list out to all of us and Kathy or send it to Kathy and she'll send it out to all of us. And I will try to put together an agenda for the next meeting that will start us to discuss from the beginning of the charter on or. Again, in the alternative, get some of the easy stuff done right off the bat and then circle back and I'll identify what I think are the provisions. You, know, you have the uh, the ballot, you have the initiatives, you have the recall. Uh, I mean, maybe there aren't that many, but I, mean, I, I just think that there are by talking all this out. And then we can um, we can talk them through. Not so much that we've come to any decision, but then hold a public hearing so we can hear from the public and then meet hard to make recommendations. And so by December, we'll just have a list of all the sections, the recommendations. We might have a you know, this, this this focus or this perception, you know, David and Aaron thought this was the way to go. You know, uh, the rest of them thought this was the way to go. That's how we did it. Or voted, or the vote was four to two to do this, whatever. Just so that the council can see what, how, how, you know, that even though it's an idea, it was a minority idea. So it didn't really get a lot of traction, but to the credit, hey, Christian, you gonna offer something? No, I was concluding. I just wanted to say this is uh, my last meeting. I'll, I'll still be here watching, but this is my last meeting as an intern in the mayor's office for the summer. So I wanted to thank all of you for letting me participate, and I've been happy to help with everything. And I would like to say we deserve, he deserves a round of applause, a Zoom applause. Thank you. Christian has done an excellent job. I take little credit. All I can do is talk about the history, but I take little credit for all the research. That was his work, and I think it's going to come in handy. And I asked Christian if he would help us, even in terms of being a scribe um, for some of the provisions, uh, and he said that he would. So that's that's. And thank you, thank you very much. And of yes, course, we can all be letters of reference for you too if you ever need it. Mm -hmm. So uh, is, let's let's pick a date in September. Our, our Tuesdays, Tuesday seems to be uh, Labor Day is the seventh. Well, either the eighth or the fifteenth. At five thirty. Fifteenth, we have council. Uh, that's a Tuesday. Oh, uh, yeah, um, you have a council. I mean, um, excuse me, excuse me. Ways and means. Sorry. You have ways and means. Yeah. Okay. Is the 8th okay? It's a day after Labor Day? Yeah, the 8th would be better for me. All right. Let's do to make a list of the things that you want to have think thought about on the charter. You're all experts now. You've got Christian has given us all the information that that we need from the legal point of view, the, you know, whether the voters or the council. I've told the mayor uh, that I need the, um, the departments so the departments will have to be in by then. Okay. May I hear a motion to adjourn? So, so moved. moved. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.